Great. Welcome back, everybody. A um, couple of announcements. So, homework is due. Well, there's a couple of conflicting messages. So, I said it was due on the 5th. I think that is Monday. And on the Slack page, when Sierra recompiled the homework, there was a little thing that I had commented out. You used to put the due dates on the homework itself. And then I decided I hate doing that because I always have to change it. So it says October 8th on the Slack page of the talk. That's a Thursday. So that doesn't quite make any sense. Anyway, um, we're pretty flexible around here. So just get it in to us. I would like it on Monday. I'm going to have a new homework for you on Wednesday regardless. So if you need to turn it in on Thursday or Friday, don't be okay. Um, but I'm get through it so that you can get on to the next homework. And so the next homework is a little bit more high-dimensional examples. So you're just going to be extending what you've learned to practical models. So the next homework kind of has you walk through a regression exercise. We're going to start putting everything together. So we've kind of learned this representation of a toe sheet. It's a gamma mixture with a normal. And you're mixing over the scale pointer. In your homework, the current one, you can solve that integral analytically and prove it that if she is a scale mixture model, you're looking for a couple parameters in that gamma. And so if you parameterize everything like me, those numbers are going to be very familiar to you. What happened to happen is what it turns out to be. Be careful when you go to the computer and you start sampling from a gamma, make sure they don't have that data turned hooked upside down. And so R does that by default. It's the difference between the scale and rate parameterization. So you've got to get used to this. Anytime you invoke a command on a computer, read the help file real quick. And so in that lab and R, if you open up, like, want to see your definition of like the gamma, the, the gamma distribution, it will show you the parameterization that they're using. If you don't do that, you're going to waste five hours one day. And so, and you'll never do it again after that. So, you're welcome if I save you the five hours. Otherwise, you're like everybody else. So, um, anyway. So, homework due on Monday, technically, but if you need the, if you didn't plan accordingly, because we conveyed some cross messaging, that's okay. Um, reviews. So, we did a review session last night. Those of you that were there knew that I was kind of like, shucks, this is not working well this time. And so the time before, we had a pretty decent amount of questions. There were a little low on the questions. This is the 14th time I've taught this class. And so I know how things look in previous years. That review session is the session where we go through details. If you have questions about calculation, that is the moment. I don't do a lot of hand integrating in class because it's kind of a waste of time. I can spend an hour doing an interval. But um, sometimes we make mistakes up here, too. We don't have our big whiteboard to stand back from. So I like to use a whiteboard to do that, work it out with you, take time, talk about the issues surrounding problems. That takes a lot of time. Um, if we don't use the review sessions like that, they're a waste of time. So um, I understand that some people had some good, compelling questions last night, but they were pretty easy to, to handle. And so we could answer those as we walk around, you could ask me in class, something like that. So I would like more technical discussions. How do you do the calculus? What's up when you're on right here? How do I, what's this identity? Where did it come from? So I've been confused about this for two years, and maybe I'll answer the question. And I will, I'll go through it in long detail. Sometimes those sessions can go on for a while, if the questions are really good. So I would like to change the format. So I think I've said this before, but by 5.20, I want questions. So on the Slack page. So you Slack for this. And if I don't have questions, there's no session. So what I used to do, this used to be effective. Um, I would walk into class, you know, five minutes after we would start review, and I would hope that the board was filled with a list of questions. And some of you have seen this before, but 
things have been different for about a year now on campus. So unless you took something from me, you know, like a year plus ago, you may have seen it. The first time you do that, it doesn't work. So I walk into the classroom and I'm like, no questions on the board. I have 20 people sitting here. And then I go for a walk. I'll be back in five minutes. If I come back in five minutes and there's nothing, it was great to see y'all. So, and then everybody starts to do it. It doesn't really matter. The only problem with this format of sending them to Slack is they're not anonymous questions. It doesn't need to be. So there's really no big deal. Just ask the questions. Anything you want to see, just go refresh it. So lots of people need to get stronger in this class. I've been looking at the homework too. And so and I've been referring back to my previous experience where people ask questions and knew the answers to problems. But we've got a dearth of that right now. And so I understand the mask thing makes it difficult. I also understand when I'm in Zoom with you guys, the only person that's uncomfortable now is me. So it used to be I could go for a walk and say I'm not going to answer questions. But I look at Zoom and I've got 20 gray faces. So I don't want you to know, the only person that's being watched is me. So I want to turn it back around to you and say, I'm serious that if I don't have any questions, I'm rolling. Let me tell you one more thing. Here's the thing, <laughs> it's a pet peeve, it never ends, but I, that's why they're pet peeves. Um, when I usually have my in-classroom review sessions, I'll get through the questions, I'll write them all down, and then I'll be like, okay, we just had a good two-hour discussion, went through details, went through some mathematics, maybe you didn't understand, fundamental theorem of calculus properly, we can do that too. So, um, we get done, I'm ready to go home, I leave the room and two people run up to me and say, I got a bunch of questions. And I gotta tell you, every time I feel the same way, but I'm usually pretty patient about it, I'm like, why didn't you ask? And they say, well, I didn't think anybody else would want to do this. How many times, you know? You guys all know what I'm talking about. So let's make this productive for both of us. So I'm super stoked to answer questions. That's what it's about. This format is even less communicative than usual because I know how it is. I can't talk to anybody in my mask either. I can't hear what they're saying. I'm always like, what? <laughs> so, anyway, we're going to make this work. So this is my idea. If you've got a better idea, um, let me know. But I'm going to be a little bit more forceful about this. So there's my forcefulness. So, so hopefully that's enough. I can use two exclamation points next time. Okay, new homework out on Wednesday. And I want to quickly discuss next topics and give you a choose your own adventure. I said we were going to do some Poisson examples next time, but it's a little bit redundant. They all look the same. I will do them. We'll just come back around to it, make sure you remember everything from the last month. But I want to move on to something a little bit more fun and then circle back around to this, because we can almost do this in a day, because now we've learned a lot of stuff. It's the same procedure. Real quick, what's the conjugate prior to a Poisson? Close. Yeah, so good job. So right now, as you're preparing for everything, know your distribution, try to be able to answer these prompts, these questions. Think about the integration you might need to do. So if I ask you to do a posterior predictive distribution on this, can you work it out? Um, we'll do that stuff relatively quickly. Sometime next week, probably. I want to give you a choice of what we cover next time. So either MCMC or Jeffrey's Fires. So Jeffries is mapping their transformation in very product. Very cool thing. So some attempt to be objective. Kind of like that. I don't dislike Michael Dean's claim about subjectivity. So I do believe all of you that know me know I'm a subjectivist. I think it's how you compare them to things. That's the only thing that matters. That's the point Michael's making his response to Jim Berger's paper. Um, how do you compare? I think that's the way, that's what he's saying, that's the way I say it. Um, is there any way you can be objective in some cases? Yeah, you want to make sure that if you do impose something, you don't mess up too badly. So we'll talk about that as we go. 
think we're kind of learning how to keep ACMs. By the end of this class, you'll have all the tools you need. Um, MCMC or Jeffries? MCMC is obviously computational stuff. So let me see hands for Jeffries. Let me see hands for MCMC. Okay, MCMC has it. So I like the iterative approach where we keep coming back to things and we do the weave instead of just here's five weeks on this, moving on. So MCMC it is. That's my favorite too. Well, so the computer comes out, simulations happen, and learning this for the first time is revolutionary. So this is the whole thing that changed everything for Daisy and the nineties. Made them relevant. Everything else was just an argument. So you shouldn't do that, but I can't do what I want to do. Now we've got computers. We understand this algorithm. Um, Nobel should be awarded. I think so. Who would get it? So why don't you guys help me with the history on MCMC when we come back around to this. I think on Monday we'll get into it. Um, who should get the Nobel Prize for Markov Chain Monte Carlo? So it's a contentious question. You might say what field would that Nobel even belong to? I think that's the problem with it. But let's say there was an outstanding award, who would get it? So I'll be waiting for answers next week. Give you some time to think about it. Okay, we're gonna cap this problem off. We've been studying this now for like three days. Um, we've seen the coverage interpretation, building a coverage interval, and if you don't condition properly your frequentist answer, while it might always be 75% or something like that on average, there's different versions of that answer that make sense. So should you report 100% and 50% or 75% all the time? So we kind of hashed out that argument. The tricky part with being a frequentist is that conditioning. What do you condition on? And there's no paradigm that has addressed this. It is a tricky problem and it changes for every problem. Here's the thing. There's no objectivity in the world. So everything is how you make comparisons and the context matters. We're figuring this out in a very painful way in society. You know, we're like, automate everything, one set of rules for everybody, and it doesn't work. So it matters where you live, when you live there, context is always important. So I think the, the real answer to the conditional frequentist is, it's hard to think about. You've got to think about this stuff. We want auto procedures, but getting rid of our thought in context of the problem, I think we throw away everything that's important. So just back to testing and confidence and all of that, there's disagreement because there's no real answer to the question. Context matters. And then you have to have some driving principles so that you're coherent and cons consistent. You may disagree with me. I've got a lot of people say that it's not true. There are methods you can come up with that are uniformly better than anything all the time. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, in one dimension. So, there's answers like that. So, I don't believe it's true. So, anyway, we'll keep thinking about this. Um, here's how we think about this. So, Bayesian procedure is step one get the likelihood. We've written that down. We've thought about it sufficiently. It's just the product of these two things. In the IID case, just have a procedure for coming up with a likelihood. I don't really think about it too much as I'm writing it down. I look at the sampling procedure, and it's like I'm on autopilot, and I write it down. I never put any thought to it. I just think about what the forward process is, the generated data, and that tells me how to construct a likelihood. And so it's an algorithm in my mind. So it's just, I do this first, and this second, I do these things, and then I multiply by this, and I know where the braces go. So we'll see lots of examples that'll help you to formulate likelihood functions. In the IIE case, it's just this product. We'll see some time series examples, lots of stuff that'll um, help us to understand that it is an automatic procedure. So I like that, that's auto, but I have to think a little bit about the context of the parameters later. So step two is going to be get the prior.
If I use an objective procedure for doing this, I subjectively employ that procedure. I have chosen the criterion of objectivity. Everything is subjective, even objective things. So, um, I Rand might have a problem with that statement, but she's wrong too. So saying that, I do like her writings. Um, that's one for the literature box in here. Here's a likelihood function written out. It's just that thing. You'll notice these little chunks of everything don't really help us. And even if these numbers were different, right here, these just show up as constants in the problem. They don't really help us at all with anything. This stuff up here that we're used to analyzing, this usually has sums that appear here once you product it all through, those are telling us what these probabilities are. The frequency of those counts, or estimating the probabilities. Since I've given you the probabilities, that doesn't tell us anything. So it's this boundary condition. So these are just indicator functions saying that x1 is one of two possibilities. So I think of this as like a boundary condition. If the parameter defines where the data lives, you need that indicator function. So every single time. If your boundaries don't exist, negative infinity to infinity, you can write in your indicator function and say, x is in the real number line. And it's always one. So we usually draw it. But if the parameter has something to do with defining where the data lives, in here it certainly does. Shifting it around, you need that indicator. Okay. This is proportional to this, so this is the likelihood function. It's kind of interesting. That's the piece. Just those two things. And I'm going to switch everything around. I like thinking about everything in terms of theta. And so I just spun that thing around. It feels like a pivot, like we were talking about last time. So I guess that's what it is. So, but it's just a rhythm. You could leave it in this form if you want. I like thinking about it like this. So there's a couple cases to look at. When x's are the same and when they're different, um, I like giving things numbers so I can think through the problem, understand what it all means. I don't think in thetas, I think in numbers, just like everybody else. So when I see an equation, I'm like, I'm not sure what this says. Sometimes I start plugging things in. Oh, that makes sense. So let's do it that way. Um, likelihood where the two numbers are the same. So I'm going to say, I got an x1 and an x2 is 3. True theta is 4. So we get to know the truth here. If I said true theta was 17 right here, and you saw this data, you violated your model assumptions. I wouldn't believe you. So you set up a problem. So these are determined from that. So there's a connection. The likelihood function makes the connection between the parameters and the data. It shows their relationship. How are they related? Well, this can be plus one or minus one on that. And that's what the indicator function is telling us. So the likelihood function is awesome. It tells you the relationship between parameters and data. Bayes' theorem upgrades that relationship to a probability measure. So I'll just say this one more time. The likelihood function is the thing that has the relationship between the data and the parameters. You know how it's for sample? You should use that relationship in your inference. Um, you think about what a classicist is doing. They're talking about randomness in x. The likelihood is kind of moving that variability in x over to the parameters, making you think about variability in the parameters. Bayes' theorem turns it into a probability measure so that you can think on a probability scale. I like that. So confidence, just going back, the reason people are having this disagreement and talking about confidence trick is it's like, what does it mean to talk about what other data sets would look like that I would get from this process? I'm trying to figure out the parameters. And so Fisher said, well, let's just auto upgrade this thing, the likelihood function. You didn't go so far as to multiply by a prior, but it's a non-class, it's a non-frequentist tool. And so it maybe can be used in some frequentist ways, 
but it's not necessarily free with this. And so what was Fisher? You don't know. Everybody thinks it's a frequent disc. So he's a lot of things. So he's a pragmatist and a theoretician, and he was often contradictory himself. Naaman and Pearson come in and say, let's turn your P value into a frequentist tool by introducing the alpha level. It is totally different. Fisher hated that. Naaman and Pearson went to war. And so then the Bayesians come out with some sort of cross hybrid of these kind of guys. So anyway, hopefully you understand the disagreement. Um, let's just figure this out. X1 minus 1. Well, this is pretty easy. So this is 2. X1 plus 1, 4. Let's do this again. X2, same thing, 2, 4. So I've got this non-frequentist contraption right here. Likelihood function. The question is, is what do we do with it? Well, let's just write it down. So our likelihood This is a 1 when theta is 2 or 4. This is a 1 when theta is 2 or 4. So when theta is 2 or 4, this product is a 1. So 2, 4, likelihood. The heights don't mean anything. The heights only mean something when you compare to itself. So the only point here is that these are the same heights. Again, likelihoods I can multiply by any positive number is still a likelihood function. So likelihoods are self-relative to each other. So I have to compare it to itself in our ratio. That's how likelihoods are always used. And so there's my likelihood function. Let's look at this one right here. So x1 is 3, x2 is 5. And so x1 minus 1, that's a 2. That's a 4. x2 minus 1, that's a 4. And that's 86. And so this is a 1 when it's theta is 2 or 4. This is a 1 when theta is 4 and 6. The only time that this product is a 1 is when theta is 4. I love that. Not on their own, but they're the premise for getting everything right, I think. So that can be really high. How high is this compared to everything else? Well, infinitely. Everything else is zero right there. So the likelihood function is kind of teaching us what theta is. How do I think about it? Well, I don't use the same language that they use on like um, CIS. When they're like, the likelihood is like 98. So I use it in a more statistical fashion. It's not a probability only. And so that's all this complication and discussion. Fisher's talking about fiducial distributions, basically using a likelihood like probability distribution. And it's like, what are the rules to that? Conversation gets real quiet. So Bayesians walk in and say, I know what I want to do with it, I want to multiply it. And so we've talked about priors. We want to think about the nature of this parameter right here. It's just shifting everything around. It's a shift prior, or a shift parameter. So I might want something that doesn't vary with shifts. I don't want to put any information into the system about where the shift location is. There's only one distribution that looks like that. In fact, it's not even a distribution. So that flat thing, I can slide it back and forth, and it looks the same to me, so it has no information about where the location is. Turns out Jeffries has a procedure, we'll talk about it after MCMC, for coming up with priors, and Jeffries would come up with the flat prior. It's improper, but it has really good properties on the analysis. So if we ended up using the flat prior, we could normalize everything. And compute the posterior distribution. The posterior distribution has properties of probability distribution. That's where Bayesians are going to get coherency from. 
We always follow Homer Boros axiom, never violate. P values do. So we'll talk about that soon enough. So this is one half right here, and this is two. And this is two. So once I multiply by this prior, that's what I get. Um, notice if my prior was different, let's say I had a prior that looked maybe like this. What it would be saying is that I value smaller values of theta more than higher values. So you might know, you might say, hey, Scotland, he's got this funny point, and he always, when he flips this point, and it shifts everything, he always uses very small theta values. So we don't know that in that, this example, so we would have no reason to do this. But you can see the impact of the problem. It's basically just waiting the space leading the likelihood function and upgrading it up to a probability measure. I choose the flat problem without any information. I think it makes sense. We'll talk about Jeffrey's derivation of this in about a week. This doesn't matter which prior I come up with. So just as long as I don't cut a zero here. So here's the one rule for Bayesian. If you think it's a possible answer, do not cut zero mass on it. Cut some mass there. Even if I had just a little bit of mass right here, lots of mass everywhere else, still get the right answer. So basically, if we're going to do subjective stuff, make sure that it doesn't work your whole analysis if you're wrong. So make sure that it kind of shields against that. We'll be talking a lot about this once we get to decision theory. So I don't know. I thought when I saw this, it was really compelling. This is probability one. Oops. Turn it into my probability function. This doesn't have anything. I'm not going to write down a number. It just be arbitrary. But our posterior distribution would look like this. This is one. So boom. I like that. It tells me what I want to know. Notice, if I use this answer, 75% coverage, it gets the automatic. So if I answer this right here, I'm right 50% of the time. If I answer this, I'm 100% of the time. So I'm conditioning. So this is the statement in Jim's paper where it's conditional frequentism or conditioning stats aren't that interesting to a Bayesian. Why? Because I've conditioned on everything. Conditioned on the data set. So it has everything that anybody else would condition on. It's automatic, so the likelihood brings that in. So, hope to likelihoods. So it is a 75% answer. I also think it's a good inferential answer. It's like, it tells me where the things are. So basically, Bayesians can keep the posterior image decide to do something with it. But the conditioning is automatic. I can understand why Deborah Meyer gets upset over these things, because she says, I would do the conditional frequentist thing. So you don't know what I would do. And it's just a question. The follow-up question is, what is your paradigm for doing that? How would you do it in these other cases? And basically, I think the answer is, I think about it. And that can, that can lead to difficulty. So, anyway, uh, hopefully you like this answer. It's not the end all be all. We don't need to um, clear up the argument right now and just say Bayesians win. There's other sides to the argument. We'll be looking at it. I really do think when it comes to decision theory, there is no real answer. But there are different answers depending on what you want to do in a different context. I think we all kind of understand that. Okay, real quickly, let me give you the easiest lecture, lecture of the whole class, and this has to do with maps. Have you used that term in your homework? What it means is maximum a posteriori. So, so I'll just say maximum a posteriori. So sometimes you'll hear people say map estimates.
or estimators. The estimate is the thing that you get after you plug numbers into an estimator. Makes sense. So the estimate is after that is plugged in, estimator is the function at hand. Okay, so let me just show you an example. Here's my posterior distribution. This is the max. This right here is the argument that maximizes everything. This is your map. We call it beta count map. Right here. So where you how you could define this is through the arg maximizing function. And you can extend this over to higher dimensional cases. So I haven't really said like what the dimensionality of theta is. Still the same thing. Let me just ask you a question. Maybe we'll come back and kick off the next lecture with an illustration of this. Say you have pi theta 1, pi theta 2. So I'm being specific that there's at least two things in here. You can think about these as both scalars. You'll convey my point. If you want to make them something else, that'll also convey my point. Um, so here's my question. Um, does integrate these out separately. Consider two margins of this distribution. So let me ask my question. Does our max Theta one hat and theta two hat is going to be the arc maximizer of over pi theta two given x. So basically, I'm just treating them marginally, one dimensionally. I integrated everything out. I get their maximums. Complete the question by saying, do these parameters right here equal to the map of this problem. So does theta 1 hat, theta 2 hat equal to theta 1, theta 2, we'll put hat over the top and we'll just define this as a map, the joint map. That's not very conventional notation. So I would probably put theta 1 map, theta 2 map. So the global map, the joint map. Can you find maps like this? Anybody ever optimize something before? The answer is pretty obvious. You just need to like think about the examples. But no, they're not. If they're independent, they are. That's obvious. So in general, no. I'll bring in a pretty picture so that you can think about this. But, Bayesians give you the ability to think jointly about the parameters. We become very accustomed to not do that. It's hard for us to think about multiple things simultaneously. I've been tested, I can think of 72 things simultaneously. So how many things you need to think of simultaneously? It's not true. <laughs> so the answer is no. Not in general. I'll code up an example for you guys so that we can at least look at the picture. But basically, if you marginalize and you start picking up a lot of maps between things, you start lifting up your points. So it depends on 
we are all massive behind the nodes. So these are integrations for averaging or accumulating maps. So in general, no. So finding joint maps is a joint optimization problem, and it can be tricky. So there are algorithms for doing this in MCMC land. We won't touch on them, I think, in this class, but maybe in a future class. Um, here's my second easiest lecture. Highest posterior densities, HPDs. And this stands for highest posterior densities. Let me remind you what a credible interval is. Okay, so this is actually a type of Bayesian interval. So credible intervals. Or sets. That's my tricky little word so that I can disconnect things. Credible intervals um, are intervals or sets such that the posterior mass. within the interval. Sets. Hello. Yeah, still one. You know, like my word bad integrate. So I use them interchangeably. So basically, if I have something like this, graph this mass right here, if this was 95%, then alpha theta, u theta, is a 95%. This is the posterior. It's pretty easy to think about. Just accumulate mass. That's a 95% interval. What are you saying is a Bayesian? Your only obligation is to say that's where I believe data is. So you might get other problems. Now, this interval I kind of just drew arbitrarily. You probably could imagine if I ended up budging this over a little bit, I could still get 95%. There's some limit how far I can push this thing. There's some limit over here that I can push this thing and still have 95%. So 95 to 5% credible intervals are not unique. So here's a mind-blowing statement. Confidence intervals are not So they just have to come. There's lots of ways you can do that as well. And so you usually don't think about it too much, but what we really probably want are the shortest intervals. So, Mohammed's already there with us. Maybe the shortest ones are unique. So let me ask you that. Are the shortest intervals unique? Yeah, it depends. If you have a flat ridge, think about a uniform distribution. I could slide around that thing. So, if you have something that's totally flat in an area, then the answer might be no. But in my picture, the answer would be yes, because there's nothing like a flat ridge in there. When you see flat ridges in your probability distributions, study it. Ask yourself, why is it happening? Is that because you created an unidentified model, or is there something really interesting like that? So usually it tells you about the area you're thinking. Not always, though. So, um, how do you get that short circle? Let me write down my 
distribution where the answer to this thing would be unique. Just can't think about that. It's one of our limitations. 
So we live in a 3D world, and it really limits our imagination sometimes. Anyway, that's what it is. So there is code out there, so you can just like look it up nowadays, play and have some stuff. What I usually do is I usually take my distribution, chop it up in a mesh, and I start accumulating little buckets as I drop the plane down the hyperplane. And so that's what my code does. It works up to like 5D. So there's some better code out there. Saying that, I rarely use it in things that are over three-dimensional because I'm going to convey it to somebody, and I can't convey anything higher than 3D. So, Anyway, um, some people like other errors. So, equal tail, credible errors. Have equal mass in the, equal mass in the tails.